As you come in and go out, there are these little cards, and they're pretty beautiful. And it's talking about what we normally call in the past lessons and carols, but this year it has how great a love. And uh, we hope that uh, you'll use this not just to remind yourself about that and the performance our choir will have that evening and worshiping of the Lord, but uh, also to be putting on social media and give to your friends. Uh, it's always a great night of celebrating and preparing us for the uh, Christmas season and the worship of our Savior and Lord Jesus. Meditation verse for today is from Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. You can read that and uh, be prepared as we hear the prelude. God will call us to worship today with Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. We have two praise songs that we're going to be singing. Let us stand as we sing forever and then beautiful Savior.
você. Let us pray. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom of Lord and you are exalted as head above all. All of our riches and honor come from you. In your hand are power and your might. And any strength that we have is because you give it. Indeed, O oh God, as we have just sung, we give thanks to you, Lord, our God and King, for you are above all things. You are good in all you do, and your love endures to your people through Christ for a thousand generations, even forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our Old Testament scripture reading is responsive. It's from Genesis 9. It's a humbling portion of scripture. For as God said in Genesis 6, 5, that he would destroy the world, which he did with the flood. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
So God made an ark of salvation for Noah and his family, picturing now Christ for us and those who enter through faith into his church, which is the ark of salvation today. And he's provided that for us, but as we read this, as soon as they come out of the ark, do we find them being great and good? No. And it just pictures for us how we continually need a savior. And we're so thankful for Jesus and his steadfast love towards us and his people. From Genesis chapter nine, let us read God's word responsibly. The sons of Noah went forth from the ark and they were Shem and Ham and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank the wine, and became drunk, and lay uncovered in his tent. And the Lord God said, Let there be a flood in the land, and the flood covered the land. And Ham, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. turned backward and they did not see their father's nakedness. And he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Let us give praise to our God. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. Let us stand and do that with one voice.
may be seated. I was baptized as a child, but I didn't grow up in the church. My family really never, ever went. And my father, I remember his statement is, I'll go to church when I can be as good as those people. Well, I'm in the church, and they're not very good. <laughs> we're in need of a savior every day and every week. And that's why we're different. And he begins to change us. He begins to change our hearts and our ways. But we come every week needing to just confess to our Father, Oh God, we love you, but we, we've, we've, <laughs> we're not very good children. But you have given us your good son. So we come every week confessing and restoring our relationship with him. He never turns away, but we do. And we are in desperate need. So we come confessing our sins. To help us do that, uh, James 4, 7 says this, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Oh my, what a phrase, right? Double-minded. Hear the sermon, and you worship. Oh, Jesus, I love you. And you go out and you go, oh, well, that looks pretty good. I think that'll make me happy. We are double-minded. And yet God continues to love us. How we're blessed to have such a gracious God and great Savior. So we come and confess that, and he receives us, and we're restored and blessed. So let us confess what the Holy Spirit would convict your own heart of. Confess it to the Lord that you might be forgiven and renew your love of Christ. And then I'll confess together for us. Let us do that individually, quietly, then I'll do it corporately. Father, we confess that we are prone to love our own wisdom so much more than yours. In our frailty and weakness, we forget to think of you, to ask for your help, or to really remember how weak and foolish we are. In our own pride and rebellion, we push away your commandments and wise instruction from your word. We confess to you that we find it difficult to trust you and we fear you in all the wrong ways. Yet remind us, O oh God, that you have punished your precious son, Jesus, in our place. And remind us of the spiritual riches we have through him that are beyond our imagination. Remind us that you're no, ang no longer angry at us because you've exhausted your anger for your people, your children, on Jesus. Holy Spirit, you do that great work of melting our hearts and Increase our faith to believe that indeed Christ has made an end to all of our sin. He has covered it past, present, and future. And in our greatest moments of weakness, indeed, bring before our eyes our sin and enable us to repent, to turn away and turn again to you. we might turn for you and find your grace sufficient for all of our need. And now, O oh God, replace our guilty fears with joy and wonder. Continue to transform our hearts 
to love you now and forever because of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And God assures us that we have his pardon. In Exodus 34, it tells us this. And he, God, passed in front of Moses as he hit him in the cleft of the rock because God was holy and Moses wasn't. And the Lord spoke forth and told him, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness and rebellion and sin. Amen. And our hope now is eternity as we look at the world. The world's changing around us. Sometimes we get great blessings and sometimes we watch too much of the news and <laughs> we find about everybody's problems in the world and it's more than we can bear. But we have a Savior and a God and a Redeemer who lives. Let us stand and give him praise. Number 690 in the hymnal, I know that my Redeemer lives. God. Please be seated. Theologians, and the truth is we're all theologians, should be able to give reasons why we believe and why the scripture is true, but that's not enough to convince anyone. Ultimately, we believe the scriptures are true because God has worked in our hearts, giving us faith that they are. But one of those human arguments that I would use is God doesn't picture saints in the Roman Catholic sense that you kind of walk on air above everybody else and don't sin, but saints are all of us who have redeemed by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And in the scripture, he gives us such great pictures of believers like you and me that that struggle. And we find in the New Testament as we read it, the Apostle Paul, who was, who was uh, Saul of Tarsus before his name is changed and his conversion we read about last week, he was seeking to destroy the church and he was bringing people back to imprison them and some even to death who believed in Jesus. And he's converted on the, roll, on the road to Damascus and he's blinded and he's left there and now God's going to speak to Ananias and he's going to say, I want you to go to Saul and become his brother and help him. And the scripture is going to tell us, what? I know who Saul is. 
And so the scripture doesn't hide our own frailties and weakness, but it shows what God does with us by his grace. So listen and rejoice as you hear Acts chapter 9, 10 to 19 this morning. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying, and he is seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry out my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you in the road by which you came has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. It's interesting and I wouldn't have thought of this, I would have known about it, but I've been in Uganda a couple of times and they've already worshiped this morning. And the, and the praise of Jesus just goes on for 24 hours across the globe on Sundays as the church is there. Pretty amazing and wonderful thing, but through the ages, those who trust Christ, uh, the basics of what we believe has been developed in creeds. One is the Apostles' Creed. And there are churches all throughout the world, even as we are going to say it in unison and confess our faith, who have confessed that. As Lord Jesus is about bringing people from every tribe and nation that he's choosing to be his and redeem them from sin and give them eternal life. So let us stand and confess together the, what we believe with the Apostles' Creed. And there's that phrase in there that talks about Jesus descending into hell. We think, well, how can that be? Well, he took God's wrath for us, so in one sense, he went to the grave. He, his human portion of him, being God, man died and took God's wrath for us. And the other portion of that understanding is hell is not we went to the place where the devil will reign for eternity and God over him as he brings judgment. But he was separated when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one he knew is the God man, his father all his life. And as he took God's wrath for us, experienced the horrors of hell. So let us. Confess together, Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, who was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. 
If you have children that would like to go to the, and you'd like them to participate in the children's Bible time, now's the time to do that. Good morning. At this time, we come before the Lord with thanksgiving and petitions. So uh, let's pray. Lord God, you have revealed yourself to us in your scriptures. You have brought your word to us in flesh through your son, Jesus. You have poured out onto us all manner of blessings. Lord, in this country, we uh, do not have much suffering. We do not have much oppression. And we are grateful for that. We are grateful for the freedom that we have to gather together like this as your people. Lord, we would pray now for the church around the world, particularly in areas of this world where there is intense persecution. We pray that you would strengthen them, lift them up, uphold them, and that you would give them your grace and mercy. Lord, we uh, come before you now with uh, requests for those in our family who don't know you. We ask that you would work in their hearts, that you would draw them to you, that they would come to understand their need for salvation. Father, we pray for our government, our federal, state, and local governments, we ask, Father, that their hearts would be turned to you and that they would make decisions that would honor you. We thank you, Father, for the celebration we had um, on Friday for Veterans Day. We thank you for those many who have served to provide this country uh, freedom. And we just pray, Father, that you would uh, bless the veterans, and we thank you that we've been able to, uh, that we are able to honor them. We pray for those, Lord, in our families that are active in the military, that you would keep them safe. Father, we would pray for the youth of this church, that you would build them up, that they would uh, seek you, and that they would honor you and that you would use them to bring your word before the world. We pray particularly for the uh, youth group here, Lord, that, um, that you would uh, cause it to grow in size and that you would bless the fellowship that they have. Father, we would come before you now with the needs of those in this body who are suffering, our brothers and sisters, Lord, who are bearing the burden of physical trials. We ask, Father, that you would be a, a comfort to them, that they would grow in their faith as they depend on you, as uh, they struggle with the ailments that they have. Lord, we would pray particularly now for Sharon, and for Artist B, we pray for Tom, Lord, and Delora, for Mac, and for Artist S. We ask that you would be a comfort to them. We ask that you would heal them, that you would relieve the pain, and that you would strengthen them to endure the suffering that they are going through now. Provide good doctors and caregivers, and Lord, give us opportunity to love them and to serve them as part of this body. We pray, Lord, for also for Joe's daughter-in-law, Laura. We pray for Cindy's parents, Lord, that you would continue to bless them and, and strengthen them. We pray for Maxine's sister, Karen, for Steve's parents, Ed and Carrie, and for Mary Sue's grandson, Andrew. Lord, we pray that you would also bring healing there for them. Father, we are so uh, grateful to you 
for the way that you bring us opportunity to serve you around the world and our missions. We pray now for uh, Dave as part of Mission to North America and a ministry to the state. Lord, we ask that you would be with uh, their brother Thomas, the associate director for state capitals, as he is going through a bone marrow transplant. We ask, Father, that you would uh, continue to uh, bring good results from that and that you would heal him. We also praise you, Lord, that you have provided a state capital associate for Maryland. Father, we praise and thank you for providing Dave and Kathy with a new home in Dublin, Ohio, nearer their family. We ask that you would provide for the sale of their home here and that their move would go smoothly, that you would give them safety in that transition. We pray, Father, for uh, open doors for the ministry to those serving in the U.S. Capitol in this troubled time. And we ask that you provide more state capital ministers. We ask that you would bless Dave as he seeks to recruit a state capital minister for Columbus, Ohio. Lord, we would also bring before you Adam and Michelle Kane in uh, Honduras. Lord, we praise you that their Reformation celebration was a success with good fellowship for the church body. We ask for continued uh, deepening relationships inside and outside the church there. And Lord, we ask that you give Adam diligence in his studies as he hopes to finish his MDiv this spring. Father, we bring before you special needs now. We ask that you would uh, particularly continue to strengthen Joe Foreman. We pray, Father, for Ken and for Butch as they are leading the recovery team in Fairmont, West Virginia. We ask that you would uh, bless them, that you would bless those men that are participating in that, that they would be able to work together well as a team, that they would be able to see your power and as you work in the hearts of the people there. And we ask, Father, that you would keep them safe and that you would draw them closer to you through that. We pray, Father, for our current church officers and for the new officer candidates as they are participating in officer training. Lord, bless them as they study your word and the requirements for being an officer. And we would continue, Father, to pray for our pastoral search team, that you would bless them, that you would be preparing us as a body and our future resident pastor. Lord, give us diligence as we pray for them um, and uh, help us to use the 30-day prayer guide continually as we pray for that endeavor. Lord, we come before you now, with humble hearts, we know, Lord, that you have given us all good things. We deserve none of it, but you are gracious, you are loving, and we just thank you most of all that we have a place with you in eternity because of the work of Jesus, because of your graciousness, because of your mercy. We thank you for that now. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus, we pray. Amen. At this time, we have the privilege of uh, hearing from our choir <laughs> and uh, worshiping the Lord through our uh, offering.
what is yours. We ask that you would take it, use it, bless your kingdom, and uh, thank you that you have given us an abundance. Thank you for the blessing of the choir and for your love poured out on us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy. By now, your Bible ought to fall open to that spot. We're going to be uh, concluding our study of Timothy today. So if you'll turn to the fourth chapter. Let me pray for us, please. Father, as we come to worship this morning, we ask that you would speak to us through your word. Father, we thank you for the ways in which you have been declaring your truth through sung word, through the reading of scripture, uh, through prayer. But now, Lord, as we come to your written word, the Bible, we ask that you would open it to our understanding and that you would bless it to our, uh, to our betterment, to our uh, sanctification. Father, we thank you. We look to you expectantly. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to this last section, these last 14 verses of uh, Paul's letter, second letter to Timothy, um, we need to recognize that there's a, this, this, this section is not filled with a lot of doctrine. You know, you can't read the Bible and not see doctrine in it. You know, those who would say that uh, we don't really want doctrine, we just want Jesus, don't really understand that the Bible's filled with doctrine. And to say that, uh, that they don't want doctrine is to say they have a doctrine. But nevertheless, that, that's, that's not for this morning's uh, message. This passage, though, does not have a lot of doctrinal teaching in it, but what it does have, uh, where I think it, we can benefit from it this morning, is that it gives us, it gives us a numerous, uh, numerous examples of how doctrine applies to life. How doctrine applies to life, because it will apply to our lives. And so we see that as we come to this. Uh, you'll remember Paul's under arrest as he writes this letter. This is the second time he's been arrested, the second time that the Roman Empire has uh, placed him under arrest. You may remember that the first time he was under what we would call house arrest, but it's not that luxurious for him this time. This time he's in prison. Uh, and in Rome, that man in a dungeon. He'd been thrown into this dungeon, and it was a much more difficult time for him. He didn't have the creature comforts of being in a home or a, a building, a uh, uh, where he was able to eat food that was prepared well for him. Uh, he was in a dank, dark, and damp dungeon, a prison. So it's understandable, as Paul comes to the end of this letter, it's understandable why he writes the way he does. Paul yearns for the companionship, for the fellowship of his beloved Timothy. These men have developed a close relationship through years of ministry together and suffering that was a, that accompanied that. Um, they were not just almost like father and son, but they were brothers who loved one another. And Paul yearns for that companionship, and so he writes to Timothy. You'll see in verse nine, he writes and says, "Do your best to come to me soon." He's making a request of Timothy. He's saying, come. And, he's, and, and then he tells us, he tells Timothy, why it's so important for him, for, that is Paul, for Timothy to come and see him. And we see some things here. Let's begin with Demas. Paul's loneliness has been heightened by Demas' actions. You may recall that Demas was a co-worker with Paul. He's mentioned a couple of other times in Scripture. In Colossians 4, Paul uh, refers to him. Uh, he says, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. He's 
So he's with him in Col Colossae. He's mentioned in Philemon. Uh, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So this Demas was known both to Timothy and to Paul, and it was a co-worker along with Paul. So what great sadness Demas' actions must have brought to Paul. Maybe you can identify with that. Here was a co-worker, a fellow laborer, seemingly a brother in the faith. whose actions have proven him to be a pretender, a fake, a fraud. As you think back over your lives, are there those whose memory brings great sadness to you and disappointment to you because though they, you once counted them as close friends and fellow believers, they have strayed and gone away? If, that, if you have had that experience, you know the sadness that it brings, the sorrow, the heartache. And that's a part of what Paul is experiencing here. Because he writes in verse 10 that this Demas has fallen in love with this present world. Fallen in love. We're not told what it was about the present world to which he had fallen prey. But I would suggest to you that there's a warning here for us this morning. There's a warning that says, here is Demas, one who for all intents and purposes would have been uh, marked as a follower of Christ, would have been marked as, uh, was a co-worker with Paul, said all the right things, apparently did all the right things, and now he has fallen prey to his lust and his desire for the world. Here's the warning. Brothers and sisters, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, do not presume upon your salvation. Do not presume upon it. In fact, the Scripture warns us and instructs us that we are to actively work out our own salvation. That doesn't mean save ourselves. But we're to be actively involved in demonstrating on a daily basis that the salvation that we profess is also that salvation which we possess. Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, keep my commands. So what is the evidence and the proof of our love for Christ when we seek to obey him? We're not going to do it perfectly. You're not going to do it perfectly. I know that. You know that. And more importantly, Jesus knows that. But he says your heart's desire, the motivation in your life, where you will put your energy is that you will keep my commands. You see, your assurance of salvation, not your salvation, but your assurance of your salvation ought never to rest upon previous experiences. When I ask someone, how do they know that they're a believer? How do they know that they're saved? How do they know they're a Christian or how they know they're a follower of Christ, or how do they know they're in Christ. All those things are different ways of saying the same thing. And they point back 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years to an experience that they had then, and that's the only evidence that they can give of faith in Christ. I shudder for them. I can't say they're not a believer. I w I, I, that's not for me to decide. But the assurance of their salvation should never be pointing to something that happened back then. It ought to instead be based upon the present and current work of God's Spirit in you. How do you know you're a believer? Because of what God's done in my life today and yesterday and the day before. How I've seen the evidence of his, cha of his sanctification process in me as I've seen that I'm growing in my love for Christ. Those are the evidences that ought to give you assurance of your salvation. And so you are to guard your heart. The scripture says guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of your life.
Matthew writes, it is out of the heart that come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. They don't come from outside. They come from the heart. And though, if you're in Christ, you've been given a new heart, until the day that you're glorified, you will continue to struggle with the remnants of that old heart, with what remains of that old nature. And so you need to work out your own salvation. You need to be looking to Christ daily for your preservation. That's, there's a doctrine called the preservation of the saints. Some people call it the perseverance of the saints. It's the same doctrine viewed from two different sides. When you talk about the perseverance of the saints, it's, the focus is from our side. We persevere. When you talk about the preservation of the saints, it's from God's side in that he preserves. And so because I am a sinner and because I know my own temptations and my, my own tendencies to want to take credit for myself uh, for things that I don't really deserve any credit for, I prefer to call it the preservation of the saints because that puts the focus on what God's done. And this is why it is, it's of such vital importance. God will per, uh, preserve those who are his. There's no question about that. The scriptures make it clear over and over again that he who has begun a good work in you will see it through to its completion. That on and on and on. Throughout the scripture you find it repeated that God will preserve those who are his, but he calls those who are his to, pre, uh, to persevere from their side. They're to persevere. You're to persevere while he preserves. Demas didn't do that. And so one who looked like a Christian may have thought he was a Christian gives evidence that indeed he is not. It's a warning for us. Not to frighten us, but to simply say, make sure you keep your focus where it belongs. On keeping the commands of Christ, not to earn your salvation, but in order that you might experience sanctification, that you might have evidence day in and day out that you belong to him. Well, Paul continues. He says, Demas has deserted him. We're going to come back to that word deserted in a couple minutes. Uh, he's gone to Thessalonica, and Crescens has gone to Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia. Presumably, though, we're, we're given no definition here or no details here, Crescens and Titus have gone on kingdom business. At least uh, Paul doesn't indicate that they, there's any fall, fall, falseness in, uh, or fault in their faith. The point he's making here is that he is alone because he writes in verse 11, Luke alone is with me. It's just Luke and me, guys. Timothy, I only have Luke here with me. And so Paul longs to see Timothy, but not just Timothy. Look at what he says here. This, uh, there's, some, there's something to be unpacked here. Not only does Paul long to see Timothy, he also wants to see who? Mark. Paul wants to see Mark, and look at what he says about him. He says he's very useful to me for ministry. That's verse 11. This is the same Mark that Paul would have nothing to do with earlier in his life. This is the Mark who deserted Paul and Barnabas on his first missionary journey. This is the same Mark that was the cause of the sharp division between Paul and Barnabas that caused them to come, come to agreement as brothers. We cannot continue to work together. We need to go in our separate ways. There was a division between them. And Barnabas takes Mark, as you'll recall, with him as his companion as he travels and carries out the work that God's given him to do. It is that same Mark. So obviously Paul has forgiven Mark for his abandonment. And not only has Paul forgiven him, but he's come to recognize that he has, uh, uh, he's very useful to me, and, uh, to me for ministry. He's earned the confidence of Paul. Paul is not concerned that this uh, Mark will again abandon him. What great hope that should give to you and to me that there is always room for restoration. There's always room 
for redemption, even after great failure. No matter how, no matter how badly you have failed in your own life, no matter how poorly you have done in being faithful in ministry, reconciliation and restoration are available to you. We see it in Mark being restored and fruitful after such a colossal failure. I may say something about Mark, too. That Mark was humble enough to recognize his failure, but had a big, a big enough view of God that he was not uh, he did not continue to beat himself up over it for the rest of his life. He found restoration not only in Paul's sight, but in God's usefulness to him. Going up on Mark. Tychius has also gone away on official business. He tells us in verse 12, he sent Tychius to, uh, to Ephesus. So Paul's alone. Verse 13, he says, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books and above all the parchments. Now, when you come, I want to take a moment and, and think about that. Paul has asked Timothy to come. Uh, he says, when you come, when does he want Timothy to come? When does he expect Timothy to come? Well, to answer that question, we need to skip ahead. We need to go down to verse 21. So look at verse 21 with me, if you will, please. He says, do your best to come before winter. So he's put a timeline, excuse me, He's put a timeline on Timothy. Winter is approaching. How many of you got up this morning and said, well, I guess winter's on its way? We recognize winter's approaching. For us, what that means is some minor inconveniences. It means we've got to put up with snow, either shoveling it or driving in it or both. It means we have to take more time to put on jackets or sweaters and coats, things before we leave. We have to dress more warmly. Uh, there are some inconveniences. In Paul's day, winter meant that was the end of travel. If winter came, travel on the seas became very, very precarious, and few, uh, few ships sailed on the seas during winter. So the shortest route for Timothy to get there, the quickest route via the sea, would be closed, and even overland travel was precarious because of the winter conditions. So Paul wants Timothy to come before winter, probably for a couple of reasons. You remember, I've said to you before, that Paul here is uh, anticipating he's not going to receive a favorable verdict from the Roman authorities. He's fully anticipating that he's going to be put to death, and he fully anticipates that he probably will be put to death before spring arrives. And so if Timothy waits till winter and can't come because it's now winter, uh, his arrival there will be too late for Paul to see him. And so that's certainly one of the reasons that Paul wants him to come soon. He's saying, come, I want to see you before I die. But there also is probably an additional reason, a very practical one. Remember I told you Paul is being held in a dark, dank, and damp uh, prison, a dungeon, so as the cold temperatures of winter approach, he'll be in need of his cloak. We don't know why he left it behind, but he's in need of it. A cloak was a, was a, a heavy woolen garment, oftentimes uh, covering for the shoulders at least down to the knees or even below. And it was designed to ward off dampness and coldness of winter. And so Paul is going to be in need of that, and he knows it, and so he asks Timothy to bring it for him. And he needs that before winter sets in. But that's not all he asks for. Paul's not only interested in these practical, physical things, he also asks him to bring the books and the parchments. Now, there's lots of debate over what these books and parchments were. Um, I spent hours reading different commentators and different views on it, and some of them were quite fanciful, and others made sense, and I'm not going to give you all of that. 
I find when a pastor does that, um, he, it tends to, if I'm sitting in the congregation, I tend to get confused. You know, I, my attitude when I, when I come is, you know, hey, you're supposed to have done the work. You tell me what you think. You know, maybe I won't agree with you, but you tell me what you think. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to tell you what I think. And I'm, I don't stand alone in this, but not all commentators are in agreement on it. The books that he's referring to are probably, uh, th th that could probably be translated as scrolls. They were probably scrolls made of papyrus. And that was the way in which the Old Testament was recorded. It was written on papyrus and it was in scrolls. You'll remember when Jesus goes into the synagogue, they bring him the scroll of Isaiah, from Isaiah and he opens it and he reads to them. That was the normal thing. So there's a good chance, although you can't say it absolutely definitively, that what Paul's asking for here are copies of the Old Testament, or at least portions of the Old Testament. Why does Paul want them? He doesn't tell us, but put yourself in Paul's place. He's expecting to die. He's uh, been this great champion of the faith. Uh, would you, if you could have one thing and you were in his place, might it not be a Bible that you would ask for someone to bring to you? So that in your last days you could find comfort and solace in that. And so Paul's doing that. Paul may have intended to write more letters. But he, so that's my, that, that's my guess. Call it an educated guess, if you will, but recognize it's a, it's a guess because Paul doesn't tell us. The scriptures don't tell us. The parchments, without doubt, the parchments would have been uh, animal skins, skins of sheep or lambs or goats or some other animal that were particularly prepared for writing. Um, and so Paul asked for those to come. Again, we don't have any idea. And there are, you know, it seems to me as I did the study that probably the most likely thing is that they, they were co either copies of previous letters that Paul had written or they were copies of, of, of other um, writers in the New Testament era. But Paul is looking for those. And he asks Timothy, to bring them. And then in the next verse, in anticipation of Timothy's arrival in Rome, he warns Paul. I mean, he, Paul warns Timothy. He says, there's a man in Rome by the name of Alexander. Be cautious. Be alert. Be aware. Alexander was a very common name, as I read in research, they said it was as common in Paul's day as the name Smith or Jones is in our day. So this Alexander was an Alexander who was call, called a worker of metal. That's really what the Greek says. It says a worker of metal. And so in Paul's day, that would have meant probably either a worker in copper or a worker in iron. And virtually every translation, I think I found one translation that did not call it him a worker in copper or a coppersmith. But that's not what the text says. That's an interpretation that we make, probably based upon the fact that that was a much more common trade than working in iron in Paul's day. But this Alexander, who was a worker in metal, probably copper, was known to Paul because he had done him much harm. That's what Paul says. We don't know what that great harm is. That's verse 14. Paul doesn't go on to tell us what that was, but what we know is that it was significant. And while Paul, Paul doesn't appear to hold any personal animosity toward Alexander, look at what he says about him. He just simply says, uh, he trusts the Lord to repay him according to his deeds. I don't think that's Paul saying, come on, God, get him for what he did to me. I think that's Paul saying, he caused me great harm. Lord, you'll take care of that. I trust the Lord will repay him for what he has done. There's a lesson there for us today, too. We would, do, we would do well to learn from Paul. We would do well to learn from him. How much time and energy is wasted by Christians in planning reprisals, defenses or payback for those who have done us great harm. 
I served a church one time where one of the elders in that church did great harm to me. Not physical harm, but uh, great harm. And I can testify that it took me a number of years to get to a point where I no longer held that against him. Now, I'm wiser. I, I certainly would never take this man into my confidence. I would never consider him to be a friend. That's wisdom. That's not holding a grudge. But I expect one day to see him in heaven. And I want to be able to go up to him there as a brother and greet him and say, Hi there. It's good to see you. That's tough. I can't tell you the number of times that things ran through my mind as to how can I get back at him? What can I do to let him know how much hurt he caused me? What can I do to let others know how, not to say un unfaithful he was? I praise God he never gave me the opportunity to do any of those things, although I spent a lot of time rehearsing in my mind what I would do if I had the opportunity. How much time we as Christians waste by planning out our reprisals, by focusing upon those who have done some sort of harm to us and how we can get back at them. We need to learn, like Paul did, to leave those things with the Lord. Let the Lord take care of it. He will see that justice is done. To be honest with you, with that particular man, I don't know what justice is anymore. I, I, that's up to the Lord. Whatever he needs, whatever he wants to do. We need to trust that with God, even though we may never even, leave to see, we may never even live to see it happen. He warns Timothy in verse 15. He says, beware of him. Beware of him yourself. When you arrive in Rome, Timothy, do not be taken in by him. Do not be unaware that this is a man who has intentions that are, that are evil. He is, verse 15, strongly opposed to our message. This is not a picture of somebody who simply rejects what Paul's saying. This is a picture of somebody who... Um, uh, not only refused to believe the good news, but was active and vocal in his opposition to it. So Timothy warns Paul. In fact, after issuing this warning, I think it's interesting. Again, we're reading into the text here a little bit. But it's interesting that the next thing Paul has to say appears in verse 16. He says, at my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. It's all... I believe that Paul is juxtapositioning those two. There's Alexander who did me great harm, and I'm trusting God with him. And it may be because of some of the harm that he did that at Paul's first hearing, maybe a preliminary hearing, that at Paul's first hearing, nobody stood by him because they were intimidated by what Alexander had done. Again, we don't know that. But Paul juxtapositions the two, saying with, with Alexander, I trust God, God will take care of whatever needs to be done. But with these others who did not stand with him, he pleads with God that it may not be charged against them. That they may not be held accountable for their failure to stand with them. The point here is that whatever the reason, no one stood beside Paul. No one stood beside him. Paul, I want to suggest here that Paul is putting into practice. Remember I said doctrine, in, in, doctrine influences life. Paul is putting into practice Jesus' instruction that we're to pray for our enemies. Those who didn't stand with him, he's praying for them. We're to pray for those, brothers and sisters. Rather than seek a reprisal or seek revenge, you need to pray for those who are your enemies. You need to pray for them. And, don't, and don't, just, don't, don't make it an imprecatory prayer. I think there's room for imprecatory prayers. But I'm not suggesting, you know, it's easy for me to pray for my enemies. Oh, Lord God, bring your wrath down upon so-and-so. That's not the kind of prayer 
that I'm talking about. That's not the kind of prayer that Paul uh, obviously is doing here. He's praying for them that they would not even be held accountable. And you can do this. And you can do it for the same reason Paul could do it. It's another lesson we see here, another doctrine that we see here. You can do it for the same reason that Paul did it. He writes, though, no, though everyone else deserted me, verse uh, 17, the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. God is always faithful. Do you believe that? Let me hear you say it. God is always faithful. Let me hear you. Now personalize it. God is always faithful to me. You hear you say it? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that? Or do you only believe it when you see him being faithful to you? When it's obvious he's faithful to you? I don't ask that because I've got an answer for any one of you. <laughs> Simply asking it as a rhetorical question. What a great comfort it is to know that God will never desert any of those for whom his son shed his precious blood. He will not desert you. Brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ, he will not desert you even if you're called upon to stand alone before those who oppose the truth. What a great comfort that is to us as, as we approach a time. A time here in our own country where you may lose everything that you hold dear. You may lose family. You may lose your job. You may lose financial security. You may lose your home. You may lose cars. You may lose friends. You may lose it all. But the Lord will not desert you. Never will he desert you. Just as he stood by Paul and strengthened him, he'll stand by you and he will strengthen you. And Paul is your example for that. You can see that in Paul's life. And if he did it for Paul, he can do it for you. And if you're in Christ, he will do it for you. But I want you to take note of something else here in this passage. Paul does not view God's strengthening of him for his own benefit. See, if, if I were a, a if I were a, a well, whatever you want to call him, name it, uh, grab it, blab it, and grab it, or name it and claim it, uh, kind of preacher, I'd, I'd end there and say, so go out, and uh, you know God's faithful. You know He's going to be faithful for you, so faithful to you. So just go out and rejoice in that, and t claim whatever you want. But that's not what Paul says. That's that that's that is a that is a truncation of what Paul says. Look at verse 17. He says, he strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Paul's saying, God stood by me, strengthening me so that the gospel would be spread. And it's the same reason for standing by you and strengthening you. Yeah, you'll get benefit from it. There's no denying that. But that's not the big reason. That's not the big cause. The big cause is so that the gospel will go forth from you in your life to those who would otherwise not hear it. I've got it written down here this way. Let me read it because I, I worked on this wording. So let me read it to you as I wrote it, not what I just said. God's faithfulness to you, though of great personal comfort, is not primarily for your benefit. Not primarily. It's so that he might be glorified. As the message of salvation is spread through you to those who would otherwise not hear it. It's for that reason that Paul was rescued from the, uh, the lion's mouth. That's probably just an idiomatic expression, meaning that he was rescued from death, at least for the time being. It may be an allusion to Daniel's deliverance from the lion in the lion's den. But Paul's eyes were focused on what awaits beyond death, what awaits beyond physical death. 
he's demonstrating to us what he's also what we've seen he also teaches keep your eyes focused on the prize that awaits all of those who complete the course you who are faithful to the end verse 18 the lord will rescue he may not spare you death at least not physical death he may even call you to a martyr's death but he will bring you verse 18 safely into his heavenly kingdom that's god's promise you if you're his you do not need to fear those who bring evil deeds against you <clears throat> or who make false claims against you and falsely accuse you you do not need to fear those who may even kill you because it is almighty God himself who will bring you safely into his heavenly kingdom and Paul Having made that point statement, Paul, he breaks into, in verse 18, he breaks into a glorious benediction. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's all for God's glory. Who else would get the glory? Because it's all God's doing. From regeneration through repentance and faith, through sanctification to glorification, it's all of God. That's why I don't know if any of you are familiar with the the Heidelberg Catechism or not. But if the very first question in the Heidelberg Catechism is this, what is your only comfort in life and death? Christian, what is your only comfort in life and death? The answer to that, my only comfort in life and death is that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, both life in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Our only comfort. We belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to our Savior Jesus. Well, let me cover these last three verses quickly, four verses. Paul concludes this letter in his usual way. It's, it's, it, there are greetings given, and, and he shares some news. Look at what he writes, beginning with verse 19. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth. And I left Tro, uh, Trophimus, who was ill, uh, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. We already talked about that. Uh, Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. So Paul's alone, but yet he's got all, all of these are Christians in Rome who are not there with him, apparently. Not, you know, not immediately with him, but he sends their greetings. He says, the Lord be with your spirit and grace be with you. Interestingly, the word translated here as you, we don't get it in English because we use the same word for singular you and plural you. This is the plural you. Paul's anticipating that his letter will be read to others. He'll be read for all to hear, even though it's a letter very personal to Timothy. His expectation is that the rest of the church will hear this letter. So I want to suggest that Paul's not only encouraging and directing Timothy and charging Timothy, but he, he has a desire that everyone know that Timothy has received this charge. And everyone understand that as Timothy fulfills this charge, though not an apostle himself, he is doing it on, apo- on um, um, uh, apostolic authority. When he carries out these responsibilities, he's doing it not as an apostle, but one who's acting with apostolic authority. I want to suggest this to you this morning. This is my final point. The same is true for you. You're not an apostle. There are no apostles today. So you're not an apostle. But when you carry out the responsibility that God has given to you, you can know that you are doing it following apostolic directives. All these things that we've seen as we've worked through this book of 2 Timothy that I've said apply to you, that that have applications in your life, as you do those and believe those, act upon those, you're acting with apostolic authority because it comes from the word of God, which has been written in this case, humanly speaking, by the Apostle Paul. Brothers and sisters, that's what you can rejoice in. Rejoice not just in the fact that God will never forsake you, but rejoice in the fact that that he has given to you the authority to share in his glory, not to share in his glory, to uh, uh, to share in his work
by showing forth his glory as you take the gospel to men and women who you have contact with. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you are a God who, who enjoys doing that which we seem, which we deem to be impossible. Father, we cannot understand the kind of faithfulness that you've shown to us and that you continue to show to us. Lord, for the most part, we, we feel pretty good about ourselves when we're faithful in small things. So, Lord, thank you for being faithful in everything. And might we be instruments who show your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to conclude with a hymn. Uh, I was supposed to tell you, and I forgot, I got a note right here. It was left for me, as I'd asked that it be left, but I forgot to tell you anyhow. Um, because of the changes that we've made to the worship folder, and there's no place in there for notes, I have a suggestion for you. Uh, because some people have said, well, I don't have any place to take notes now. Well, you've got, I've got two suggestions. One, you can take notes in your Bible. That's okay. But uh, you limit it in space there. The other thing that you might do is consider getting a spiral notebook of some sort that you can actually take notes, and you can take notes, in a, and it'll be in some place where you can refer back to it three weeks, six weeks, six months, or seven years from now, because I know what happens with these when you write notes on them. You save them for a while, and eventually they get thrown away. And it's not that what I have to say is so important, but it's what the Lord has to say that's important. So I would just encourage you, you know, get a notebook that you dedicate to simply, uh, that you dedicate to simply bring it on Sundays and taking notes, okay? The other thing I was asked to remind you of is at the back, uh, you will find, I think that's on the credenzas in the hall, in the uh, vestibule, you'll find uh, all the announcements and all the prayer stuff, all those things that used to take up so much space here. By the way, I, I've been told we're saving about 80% of the paper that we were using by doing this rather than printing that multi-page bulletin. Um, and so, folks, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a big green person, but we're doing something green, so take, you know, re rejoice in that. <laughs> Uh, anyhow, those are out there. If you really want them in print, uh, you can find them out there after the service. Let's stand together now and sing our concluding hymn, hymn number uh, four, 529, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling.
And now as you go, may the grace and the peace and the love of God be with you as his children. Amen.